Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hotla Mode and today on Hotla Mode we are coming to you with a December 2021 fashion roast. We're going to be breaking down all of the looks that were most important in the month of December 2021, last year, moving on to a new year. Hopefully this one is better than the last, but I'm not going to say anymore because I don't want to jinx it. First up, we have Ariana Grande. Now she is wearing Valentino. This is, I believe, probably haute couture or it's at least custom. It's a strapless dress and what I presume is like a beautiful silk taffeta in yellow. I'm not going to call this highlighter yellow because I don't think it's like neon. I think it's a very bright yellow. I think there's a difference. I am intrigued by it. I like Ariana as, you know, somebody in Valentino. I appreciate it. She's going for more sort of ball gowny vibes. She has these black leather gloves that sort of go right up to the bicep. I just think maybe a little bit more color blocking, a little bit more of a silhouette that is exciting would have done well here. I don't think it's bad in any way. I just don't think it's exhilarating and maybe it doesn't need to be exhilarating i think ariana has done a really good job recently of sort of stepping it up in terms of fashion over the past few months and i really appreciate that i'm really happy with that i am like willing to just let this be like oh okay cool ball gown valentino yellow cross it off the list check it we got it done but i think maybe something a little bit more exciting from valentino especially kind of would have been better but as of right now ariana has really like given me layers recently and I appreciate that and so like I'm okay with it just being here it's it's just it's fine I'm fine she's fine we're all fine we're moving on next up is Ashley Park she is wearing Dior very Emily in Paris move but in real life it's a black shirt with a little short sleeve some buttons you know what do the buttons have on them a CD you know because it's Dior obviously a little black pant that like fits okay a black strappy shoe and a bag that's like the canage you know very dior-esque in and of himself it's just kind of blah you know what i mean it's, it's just not really super interesting or intriguing or something i care about or something i want to care about and like that's just kind of the territory sometimes with dior but you know sometimes mgc pulls it out of the bag on occasion and so like it's doable and this is just not one of those moments so ashley next time you go to dior event party show anything shoot for something a little bit more exciting not too exciting because you don't want to be showing up in in a boxing jacket but something just you know a little bit more not that that's all next up is Billie eilish she's wearing simone rocha i feel very vindicated i feel like i've been talking about this for over a year and i just i feel like the law of attraction worked for me in this regard if i if i say it enough it will happen billy was hosting snl and this was the episode prior to christmas this simone rocha dress i think is perfect i think it works i think it makes sense i believe this is from it's actually spring 2022 uh which was shown you know as recent a September October and I think it's a great look to sort of fit in with that whole Christmas holiday aesthetic I'm not saying Christmas is the only holiday that has an aesthetic listen you want to go blue and white do a little Hanukkah moment love that journey you want to do a green and a red and like a black and like go for a Kwanzaa experience also love that but I think the the white and the red really has this very Yule which was then like co-opted by Christmas. I just love the dress. I think it works. I think it makes sense for Billy. I think it makes sense for Simone Rocha. Now, if we started the sleeves, it's kind of poofy, very light, very sort of wintry in this creamy white moment. You then have what is a cocktail dress, essentially. It has its sort of neckline going right above the bust area has some cute little straps and it has some lace going on throughout. So you have lace at the collar and then you have lace at the cuffs, which I think is really, really sweet. I think that definitely plays into the whole concept of lace in terms of relationships to the United Kingdom, England, Great Britain, Wales, Scotland. We love that. We think it's great, think it's wonderful, gorgeous, stunning, amazing. Billy's not really like a super lacy person, although recently she has worn stuff that's semi-lacy. So I think that she's she's working, expanding on fabrics and textiles, which is good. Gert, though, I think is so fantastic because she looks like a little cream puff, and I think it fits into that whole oversized thing that we really know and love from Billy. And I've said it from the beginning. It's fine to wear your shorts and your jumpsuits and your sweatsuits and your tracksuits and your whatever suits. That's I get it. I understand it. I think it's lovely. But I also think that with time you'll get tired of that. And you'll want to move into something that's a little bit more not athletic fabrics. So I think this is 
that done perfectly. I think the way that these little ribbon embroideries trim and, and create this really beautiful sort of, you know, wavy motif, the fact that there's still lace towards the bottom and then there's this poof of tulle that sort of juts out and creates this cream puffy skirt silhouette. I just think it's a nice look. Honestly, I think it makes sense. I think it works. I think it's Billy working with a brand that, again, sort of fits her whole vibe without it being the stuff that we're used to seeing from her. As for the shoes, which were kind of controversial, this feels a bit more styling. I don't know where she got them from. I haven't really looked that deep into it. I know that they're not Simone Rocha, but I think this faux fur little uh, leg warmer moment tied with the ribbons and the, these bright red shoes, it feels like it's something that the stylist put together as like a styling thing. It's not look 47 off of the Vogue runway app. It's let me make something that kind of tries to fit into this whole aesthetic and it's kind of weird and kind of kooky, but like, that's the beauty of it. I mean, like you wouldn't have Destiny's Child iconic looks without literally the handcrafted homemade sort of elements of it. Not to compare this these shoes at all to Destiny's Child, but the element of styling, of putting together something creative, putting something together that's not already made in some, you know, big brand or whatever's factories. Although like if this is made in some big brands factories, well, I'm going to sound dumb, but you get what I'm saying. It feels like something is being finagled, finessed, MacGyvered, and that that we love, that we appreciate. Overall, I think it's a great look. I think it's wonderful. I think it's me getting exactly what I want. So I'm overjoyed. It was my Christmas present, you know what I mean? Wrapped up in white and red. Next up is Carrie Ann Moss. Now she is wearing Oscar de la Renta. Now this was to the premiere of The Matrix. Here's the thing. Have I seen The Matrix fully? No. Have I seen half of it? Kinda. Yes. I got like Lawrence Fishburne was there and I was like, oh my God. And then I kind of stopped. I don't know why. But the thing is this dress, when you see it, you're probably like, oh, why are you talking about this? Like you better drag the shit out of it. And I would understand where you're coming from on, in that mentality and that thought process. But, but the reason that I think this dress is so amazing is not because of the little, you know, micro pleated cape. It's not because of the black dress. It's not really super exciting in terms of silhouette, fabrication, anything like that. The reason that I think it's so great, so, so great, is the embroidery on that skirt. Now, the black dress in and of itself essentially references black sort of background of the Matrix coding, which is seen throughout different movies. I'm pretty positive. Again, haven't seen it all the way through, but pretty positive that's a reference. And you have this green embroidery that is essentially meant to mirror the coding data characters that is seen throughout the movie, which you can see on the step and repeat here. Shout out to a step and repeat. Thing is, Oscar de la Renta isn't a brand that you associate with a silhouette or even necessarily a fabric. You know what I mean? Like Silk Gazar is Balenciaga. Quilted leather is Coco Chanel and Tweed. Add her in there. The silhouette of the new look is Bing Bang Boom Dior. Those are things that people commonly associate with those brands. With Oscar de la Renta, it's not really a brand that outside of probably the US and a very sort of wealthy upper crust clientele would really be like, oh my god, Oscar de la Renta, of course. The thing about Oscar though is the embroidery is so, 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 so essential to the brand's history. And the great thing about this dress is that green is not only embroidered with little sequins in green, but it's also embroidered with the, the name of the brand, Oscar de Renta. And I think that that's a beautiful little subtle way of Oscar working within its wheelhouse, within its brand DNA and heritage and bringing it into something that is a context clue and sort of method dressing element of the Matrix. I think it's brilliant. I think it's wonderful. I think it's cool. And it's Oscar staying in his lane. It's not trying to be like, we are inventing a new silhouette. It's not, we are trying to invent a new fabric. It's, this is what we've been doing since the 1960s, 1970s. And we're going to keep doing it. Fernando, Garcia, Laura, Kim, doing it. Smart, wonderful, proud of you. The other thing is Oscar's embroidery is stunning. If you look back at pieces from the late 60s, the 70s, probably up to like the 80s or so. They're like feats of embroidery because the other thing is you have to understand that Oscar himself trained under Balenciaga, not at Balenciaga, but under Isa, which is the Spanish brand that he had in Spain. So there's Balenciaga was in France and then Isa, E-I-Z-A, was based in Spain. So the thing is, Oscar comes from like a very good pedigree. It's the same pedigree as some may say, Courage. There's a beautiful pedigree family tree of fashion. So in that regard, I think it's really lovely. I think it's really wonderful. I think it's really smart. I think it's Oscar doing what Oscar does best and bringing it into a different, fun, more modern context. I'm proud. I'm happy. So good. 
Next up, we have Doja Cat. Now, she is wearing Charlotte Knowles, otherwise known as Knowles. Now, this is from the Spring 2022 collection. I love it, honestly, because I think it fits this whole concept of Charlotte Knowles to the umpteenth degree. So we have an off-the-shoulder little plaid checked bodysuit situation. It's long-sleeved. It comes right to, you know, the hand area. It has that intriguing sort of halter neck style very early 2000s which is very much a reference for the brand and then on top of that you have a boned corset that's not your run-of-the-mill corset again it's like a halter style but it wraps around it takes the sort of you know very flexible stretchy fabric that's very clingy and sort of like in cases the bosoms here it lets them sort of be seen it lets them sort of you know but at the same time like this is a boned corset and Knowles has talked about how they both which is Alexandre Arsenault and Charlotte Knowles have sort of seen the 1800s and corsetry and all of those sorts of elements as inspiration so you can sort of see that it's a new take on the corset it's strange and it's weird but it's appreciable because it's not your run-of-the-mill boned corset. I'm just going to take Vivian Westwood's work and recreate it so that everybody thinks I'm cool. You have to be good at making corsets. It's not an easy thing. And then you just add in this graphic skirt. It's very sort of like grungy, kind of like dirty looking. But at the same time, I think it works. When this look was shown, it was in a dark car park in London. And I think that it sort of fits that whole vibe. It feels very sort of fast and furious, but like chic and fun and nice and again it's always appreciable that doja goes and does stuff that's strange and weird and doesn't always make a lot of sense but i think this makes a lot of sense it's cool it's chic on top of that you have these shoes i don't understand them i don't need to understand them because they're weird and they're good and they're sexy and they're stunning and can she walk in them i don't know but i don't need to next up we have dua lipa she's wearing bottega veneta this is fall 2021 this was Daniel Lee's second to last collection, I believe. Now, this is essentially just a, a really short cocktail dress. And you can see that in the way that it's literally like a tube top just turned into a dress. And by dress, I mean like it's extended maybe about a foot. It is not, it's not much. But the thing that makes this so good is the yarn loops that start from the outer pelvic region and sort of goes all around the dress. Now, some of you may be saying, Luke, why are you talking about the pelvis? But I'm talking about the pelvis because I think that these yarn loops play into the whole idea of Bottega Veneta and texture. I think Daniel Lee did a really, really good job of bringing Bottega's ready to wear and also its accessories to the minds of people in the concept of this is a brand about texture. It doesn't matter what textiles you're using, whether it's leather, whether it's yarns, whether it's faux furs, it's about Texture. Texture is important. Texture plays a lot of roles. And I mean, if you look at the Interreccio weave of leather bags from Bottega, it's kind of like what Bottega is known for. Now, these loops, I think, are really, really great in the sense of they create a texture. They're layered on top of each other. Are they yarn? I'm not exactly sure, but there's some sort of fabric loop. And the way that they're layered on top of each other creates a real sort of volume. Now, when I think about it, I'm thinking about it in the context of like a pannier, you know, the 18th century little, they're like a caged side accessory that, you know, women of the aristocracy would put on their hips. It was almost like a waist belt. And then it would create big sort of couldn't get through the door going forward sort of feeling. And then you'd add your robe à la française or robe à la anglaise on top of it. And it was big, it was crazy, and they looked like tables. So I bring that up because I'm wondering if this was Daniel Lee's way of sort of taking the pannier and making it a little bit more modern. And then I think if you take the way that Western society looks at the body, talks about the body, thinks about the body, I'm wondering if it plays into this whole idea of like Kim Kardashian and sort of accentuating her body to emulate black women and sort of like steal that but make it only palatable when she does it because she is not a black woman. Or if it's sort of TikTok's obsession with BBLs and things like that, the way that the body is sort of changed in terms of proportions. And so that's kind of where I'm going with my thought process and why this dress is intriguing and good. And it's intriguing and good also because again, you're taking those elements of history, current culture, and the brand's DNA of texture and sort of like weaving it all into something that feels very modern. Do you love it necessarily? No, and that's okay. But does it feel like something that is modern? I think so. And so I appreciate that. I think it's smart. I think it's intriguing. Taking some time, but I'm there with it. The thing is the shoes. So I love the shoes. They're big old pump, big old stiletto. Mm, nah, no, but it was New Year's Eve. So like, okay, fine. We're, we're okay with it. But for the most part, I love this dress that 
is just barely a dress. Next up is Asa Gonzalez and she is wearing Tom Ford. You have a sequin tank top and sequin basketball shorts. I appreciate it's Tom Ford, who is the CFDA, President Council of Fashion Designers of America, taking American sportswear ideas, you know, a tank top and a basketball short and bringing it into this very like luxurious element of covering it in sequins to the point where I can only imagine how much those cost. And then on top of that, it's like Tom Ford which is always expensive. So like, I see what we're doing there. The blue silk blazer I'm not seeing and the pink silk shoes, heels, I'm not seeing either. This is not super understandable in that context. It just feels a little bit strange. Maybe if we remove the blazer, it could be a little bit more, mm. this was a rough collection, spring 2022 wise, unfortunately. And so here, I appreciate what we're going for, but like, you know, you gotta get your, get your, get your, get your head in the game, gals. All of you. Asa, Tom Ford, watch High School Musical, maybe. Maybe that'll help. Next up, we have Emma Corrin. Now, she is wearing Marco Ribeiro. I think Emma Corrin is very similar to Doja Cat for me. They're going to go and do some weird stuff and just got to sit back and try to understand it. You don't always understand it. Sometimes you respond to it a little bit not lovingly. That's the way it is, but there's, there's a meaning in there. Do I know the meaning of this? Look, I do not. There is a blue shirt underneath, and I believe that it has this pink top sort of sewn on top as well. So you have a blue sort of collar and a blue shirt underneath, and then you have this pink gathered top that goes right to the center here. But my issue is it looks like a butthole. And I don't want to mean that. I don't, I really try not to like do that stupid associating avant-garde fashion with like dumb shit that people that don't understand clothing on Twitter would do. But I've seen enough of them in my life to, you know, just say, eeh, can't deny it. I appreciate that we went somewhere strange. The pants fit-ish, though, so that's good. And the shoes are intriguing. I don't want to stop Emma doing her weird stuff, but it looks like a hole. That's, that's, that's it. It's, it's very artificial, some may say. Next up, we have Florence Pugh. Now, she is wearing Valentino. Now, this is a look from spring 2022, and it is based on a fall 1967 Valentino look, which, honestly, love, think it's great. Florence went for the full, or almost the full look. You have these little bandeau and high-waisted biker short moment going on underneath. When you look at the original look, it's like a tunic with a wide leg pant. I think this is a good way for Pure Paolo Piccioli to sort of interpret that look in a much more modern context. I think here it works. On top of that, if you don't want to buy the coat, like a client could just say, ah, oh, this is a cute workout fit. You know what I mean? Do I know anybody that will work out in Valentino? No, but do I put it past people? No. The other thing is this coat is stunning. It's gorgeous. Again, it's a reference back to that fall 1967 collection. This look also was worn by Zendaya when she was promoting the spring 2022 collection days before it happened back in September or October. And I have the utmost respect for Florence Pugh for wearing this because I would never touch anything that Zendaya wore before me. And I only say that because it's Zendaya. I don't really believe in the whole like, who wore it better thing? Because I don't like comparing and contrasting is like weird like that. But I think that Florence did a good job here. I don't think it's a look that is crazy, ridiculous, over the top. I think that it works. I think it's a beautiful coat. So I will say I think the biggest misstep with the look is the orange shoe. I understand we're going for a tiger sort of situation. I mean, the jacket obviously is a tiger motif, but I think maybe a gold heel would have just made sense. I think it would have tied in more with the V logo on the bag as well as the chain and the orange. It's just not there. It's, it's too bright it's too much it's too heavy so I think that's the only misstep that was taken throughout the whole look but other than that very appreciable next up we have Gemma Chan now she is wearing Shu Shu Tong now Shu Shu Tong is a brand that is based out of Shanghai it was started by Liu Shu Lei and Yu Tong Jiang who are a duo that studied in London and worked amongst brands like Gareth Pugh and Simone Rocha and then decided to go back to Shanghai to start their own brand and if you look at the London Fashion Week schedule, there are a few different Chinese brands that are starting to amass themselves on the London schedule. I think it's a very intriguing sort of situation. We could get into it at a later date. But 
In the same way that Yoji Yamamoto and Rei Kawakubo sort of came in the 1980s, I think that there is this next generation of Chinese designers who are going to break into the Fashion Week schedule, already have, but will slowly but surely sort of build a bigger presence, which I'm very intrigued to see. But I digress. Let's talk about Gemma's look. So it's a bow sort of top. It looks like it's meant to sort of create this effect of a big old bow. There's a high-waisted sort of pencil skirt moment going on and then at the top you can sort of see that there are straps I believe and then a neckline that sort of has dripping jewels. I don't think it's the craziest look I've ever seen from Gemma Chan not by a long shot but at the same time I think that it's something that feels somewhat approachable but at the same time has that little spark of excitement both in terms of the bow isn't that exciting but you know it's not super normal. But I think the neckline of the crystals sort of really helps to add a little bit of excitement, a little bit of intrigue, a little bit of Marilyn Monroe, diamonds or a girl's best friend sort of experience, but in white. Do I love the look? Absolutely not. But do I like getting to talk about a cool up and coming brand like Shushu Tong? Sure. Next up, we have Hailey Bieber, and she is wearing Nancy Dojaka. Now, Nancy Dojaka, if you do not know, is the winner of the 2021 LVMH Prize. But she also is one of the intriguing sort of London-based designers who is bringing this whole idea of lingerie, sensuality, and all of that into a newer sort of context in the same way that we talked about Charlotte Knowles, or Knowles as it's known now. Nancy sort of works in that same frame of mind where it's very clingy fabrics. There's a lot of sort of elements of lingerie brought into outerwear. And so you can see that in this look. Nenzi for the most part has usually worked in black and it's sort of always been something that you've seen. But with recent collections, she's really started to get into different colors, which is nice to see. So we have black up top. We have it on the bra. We have it on the sort of cut away sleeves that expose a bit of the shoulder. It's sheer in, in detail so you can see the entirety of the arm, but then also has like a cut right at the inside of the wrist. So you can sort of see the fall away of the sleeve there too. And again, that's sort of one of the intriguing aspects of Nenzi's work is it's a lot about playing with this idea of sensuality, what you can see, what you can't. Also, we have cutouts in the center here. So there's a little bit of a space both at the sternum and also right below the sternum. And then you have sheer little pockets that in reality, I'm sure are darker in color, but they start to create a little bit of a tan on Haley's sort of rib cage area. And then you can see a sort of lighter brown and then this sort of more orange brown that sort of, you know, as it goes down, it almost ombre the gradients into different sort of different earth tones, if you will. Will I say that this is the craziest Nancy Dojaka look that we've ever seen? No, but at the same time, I think, again, it's intriguing to see younger, cool, up and coming brands starting to be seen on big celebrities. I know that Zendaya wore Nancy Dojaka. We talked about it in our Dune breakdown video of all of her method dressing. But overall, honestly, I think it's a cute look. Would I like to have seen a full experience from Haley here? You know, head to toe, absolutely. But besides that, it's nice to see. Next up is Kate Middleton. She is wearing Katherine Walker. Now, Katherine Walker, if you guys do not know, which I don't really blame you, was a designer that Princess Diana herself really was drawn to. I mean, if you look at a lot of her wardrobe, there were just Catherine Walker, Catherine Walker, Catherine Walker pieces throughout in all different sort of styles, cuts, whether it was skirt suits or whether it was gowns or whether it was just regular dresses or pantsuits, whatever it was. Princess Diana loved a Catherine Walker. Kate here, I think, is obviously trying to like channel that and I appreciate it because I think she's trying to get her like Tatler, the sun, brownie points. I understand where we're coming from with that. I get it. I appreciate what we're trying to do, but I think that Kate needs to, rather than trying to be like, oh, paying homage, paying homage, paying homage, which again, I get why. I just think it's better for her to have gone full this is what I'm doing. This is who I am. Kate is very upper crusty, aristocratic. She's not really trying to make waves. She's going to be the queen eventually. I get it. I understand, but I don't think that it hurts to pull a little bit of a Jackie Kennedy moment, pull out a Halston, you know what I mean? Like invent a designer. When you think about Princess Diana, the thing was she helped to really 
skyrocket a lot of designers. And I'm not saying that Kate hasn't in her time, but they're names that now you're like, oh, of course, Manolo Blahnik, Princess Diana was very, very helpful, you know, in bringing around Gianni Versace. I mean, he was around himself already, but Princess Diana really definitely, I'm sure, helped to sort of boost that brand to a degree too. So I think with this look, it's beautifully fitted. It looks gorgeous. It looks stunning. I mean, like the bow detail of the neckline, I'm not really understanding. I think that needs to fix itself. But listen, Catherine Walker still can cut like nobody else can cut or she can cut very well. I mean, he who can cut like nobody else could cut with Alexander McQueen. That's also my thing is like, I don't know, bring on the Sarah Burton. You know what I mean? Kate, I love it. I'm here for it. I'm living, I'm laughing. Give me the McQueen moments. That's that's what we need. That's what we deserve. Do I think this is fitted beautifully? Absolutely. Do I think it's a little bit blah? Sure. Is it to like her, I don't know, church Westminster Abbey event? So I understand why we're doing what we're doing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, if you wanted somebody to go lick the royal family's hole, this is not the channel for it. So I'm always going to ask a little bit more of Kitty Cat. Next up is Kendall Jenner and she is wearing Carolina Herrera. Now, Listen, in the photo that we're showing, it's beautiful. A mermaid, this is not. This is actually a trumpet gown because the trumpet comes from higher. The mermaid comes from lower. So now you know trumpet high, mermaid low. Although I would put mermaids above trumpets in my personal loves, but like to each. In reality, is it a fitted, beautiful gown? Yes. Do I think that it sort of fits in with the Carolina Herrera history? Yeah. Carolina Herrera, when I think of the brand, I think of literally a white button down shirt and a big old beautiful silk ball gown skirt. Now I know Kendall Jenner is not wearing a button down shirt, but I do think that this whole skirt element, this trumpet skirt really does fit in with the whole idea of the Carolina Herrera brand. Wes Gordon is really doing a number. He's trying to bring it back, which I appreciate. I think that there is a little bit of excitement being brought around all of these New York brands. We talked about it before with Oscar de la Renta. Carolina Herrera is a brand that does have a really, really great history. It's just, it needs somebody that can pull it out, make it modern, give it fun give it excitement, give it intrigue. I think that here, is it avant-garde, over the top, ridiculous? No, but is it nice? Is it sweet? Does it have a good shape? Absolutely. Put it on somebody else that's not Kendall, I would more or less say that it still would look good. That's an important design element, I will say. Next up is Kim Kardashian. Now, we could talk about two of her different looks because they're almost the same thing. They are essentially two different Balenciaga draped looks that have the pant shoe underneath in matching colors. So one is brown, has a higher neckline, full glove, draped to one side. It has a cutaway sort of slit. It's brilliant. I also think that in reality, it's a great, great, great silhouette for Kim. I think it's a sort of easy go-to style that you can definitely associate with her. And also with Demna, the thing is, this is one of his signature sort of looks of Balenciaga. It's just something that when you see it, you say, oh, Balenciaga, got it. And so I think for Kim, it's a great way to sort of, again, have this emphasis on the idea of the body, have this emphasis on the idea of an hourglass silhouette. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate the brown by any means. Listen, I think North looks great in a crushed velvet Balenciaga look. Don't even get me started. North, I think is iconic. And then Chloe, you know why, I know why, we all know why, just this look is not working. So let's just get it going. Next up is Lana Del Rey. I don't know if I want to talk about this because it's going to feel like first degree murder. What the f is that green dress? It's just, it's, it's bad. It's too Fashion Nova. And since we did the Dillers thing a while ago, Lana, it's just, it's not, it's not been the same. The House of Sunny print needs to go, not because it's a bad print. It's just, it's just not good when it's ruched right up the center. And then the bra sort of thing, if we could see what the design was, you know, maybe, maybe it could be salvaged. Maybe it'd be a different look, but no, we have to put a black Carhartt-esque jacket over top. And listen, I love a Carhartt. I love a Carhartt-esque jacket, but then Lana sort of ruins it even further because she adds this like janitor jacket over top and listen, like love a janitor, think they're great. I just don't think a janitor's jacket should be forced to cover that dress. You know what I mean? Like I feel bad for the janitor's jacket. I feel bad for the dress. I feel bad for everything involved in, in the look. It just doesn't make sense. And then on top of it, you have like a almost knee high suede tan boot. And it's just, I don't know. What was the direction? What were we trying to do here? I would love to know. Somebody please explain. I have a lot of questions, but I'm not sure that I would like for them to be answered. So 
Lana. No, thank you. You are no longer our national anthem. Next up is Laura Harrier. She is wearing Loewe. Now, this is from the Spring 2022 collection. Now, I know all of you are going to say, oh my god, you just dragged the shit out of that Lana Del Rey look. Like, how can you now sit here and want to tell us that this is cute? Listen, I like an avant. Also, with Loewe, Jonathan Anderson, the, the avant thing just sort of fits in. It's how it works. It's it's just sort of what it does. I'm willing to go to bat. Now, this look, let's, let's discuss. There's a white sort of draped element and then a sort of silky light blue draped element. It creates a top. It creates Greco-Roman antiquity. Then it's paired with a sort of baggy little jodhpur-esque pant in a lighter blue and a sort of silver heel sandal moment going on. Will I say that it is amazing? No. No, no, I won't. I won't. I can say that confidently. Cut it more slack than I normally would because it's trying to be avant-garde. It wants to be avant-garde. It is avant-garde. Yeah, 100%. Listen, I never said I was perfect. You know, is it a little bit of like a reverse take on the Zoom meeting attire instead of wearing a normal sort of top and just a blanket around your waist. You, you know, you're doing a blanket around your top, normal attire around your waist. I'm sure that Jonathan Anderson, for the most part, was trying to go for this idea of, you know, draping, maybe referencing designers like v Madame Grey, who, you know, went and sort of, again, referenced that ancient Roman and Greco, you know, antiquity elements of just wrapping fabric and fabric and fabric around the body. I think it's trying to sort of play on this idea of like a train through the element of a top, which I think is again sort of commendable. I just think it's hard looking at all the fabric, not working as well as one would with love in this moment, in this lighting, against the backdrop. It just, it just doesn't, it doesn't hit home. So I appreciate Laura Harrier going for it, most definitely. I just think it doesn't look as good as it did on the, the runway. And even then, it was experimental. Love when the girls go and they do experiment. We are here for it. Ra, ra, sis, boom, ba. Even I'm having a, a tough time registering her as major. Next up is Lil Nas X. He is wearing Balmain. Now, listen, I think this is fun. Um, it looks like there's some sort of jumpsuit element going on with these little draps that I'm sure are holding the jumpsuit together. It's this really deep, low plunging top with a blazer over top. I love it. I think it's actually rather brilliant. It sort of fits in with what you see from the women's wear of Balmain quite often, and men's wear from Balmain doesn't really get as much love on the red carpet. The other thing is Lil Nas X is like so unafraid to just do whatever that it's very much so something we should be living laughing and loving i currently am doing it i think he most definitely has no problem sort of showcasing his body and i think this is a great look for that i think it subverts the idea of who should be wearing a low plunging chap and then you place that sort of double-breasted bellman blazer that you know you instantly sort of look at and say oh olivier there you are the cutaway pant in the on the jumpsuit maybe is not best thing I understand why it was done mostly because I'm sure that the majority of the men that buy the menswear from Bellman probably don't wear Rick Owens kiss boots I think we could have just closed the split hems on this little jumpsuit and just let it sort of pool or flow all the way down and it kind of would have been a little bit more exciting a little bit more intriguing but besides that this I think is a risk that pays off I think it works I think it's fun again I think it's something that we really don't see a lot from menswear and so I appreciate it I think it looks good I think it works I think it is fine Next up is Lily Collins. She's wearing Valentino. I believe this is haute couture because the crazy kooky motif more or less is probably a reference or probably is from fall 2021. The haute couture collection that Pier Paolo worked with different artists bring their motifs, their styles, their art into the haute couture collection. You have all these sort of waves of green, gray, there are little patches of sequins. It's a bubbly sort of top with a fun big old sleeve which is done. And then a little skirt underneath the stockings and the shoes. Very Lily Collins. Some may say, oh, this is where Emily gets it from. I want to always say like, Lily Collins is such a better dresser than Emily. And then I say, maybe that's me being a little bit too optimistic. I don't think Lily is a horrible dresser, but I think there are better Valentino looks we could have we picked out from that collection. I think it's okay. I think it's 
fine, but where's the drama? Where's the excitement? Where's the, oof, oh my God, that is amazing. Oh, why didn't we get that in Emily in Paris? You know, where's that? Because this, this does look like something Emily would wear. Maybe that's method dressing, but that's a method dressing I don't want to see. I don't think anybody really wants to see. We're good. I'm sure that there's a shit ton of work that went into the pieces. They're beautiful. They're stunning in that craftsmanship element, but there are better Valentino looks to be worn. Next up is Maddie Ziegler. She is wearing Missoni. I think she looks radiant, honestly. I think she looks stunned. I think she looks grown up. I think she looks gorgeous. This halter is... I think it's beautiful. I think it elongates the neck. I think it makes her look so tall. This motif is not a Missoni motif that I'd be like, oh my god, Missoni. But I think when you see and or hear that it's Missoni, you say, oh, okay, all right. I would love for the Missoni knits to be brought back in full flux, but until then, this sort of silky, shimmery motif moment going on here is great. I think it fits her really, really well. I think it creates a little bit of drama, a little bit of intrigue, a little bit of excitement. The halter, again, I think really gives this elegance to the silhouette. I think it really brings it into something much more exciting, much more grown up, without it being sort of like, I don't know, vulgar, which, don't get it twisted, I love a bit of vulgarity. But overall, listen, it's nothing to write home about, but I think it's a nice little step into elegance and it works out well. Next up is Madison Beer. She is wearing Nenzi Dojaka. And now listen, I think this is, I think this is good. I think this is solid. I think this works. Madison likes a cocktail dress. I don't know if she actually likes a cocktail, but I think that this sort of very, what essentially is like a high-waisted skirt that goes almost to right under, you know, the bust with a little bra that is attached, goes straps over, straps to the side. And then it has the sort of burgundy moment. And then the top of the bra is a little bit red. I think that works. I think it fits in with Nenzi's ideas. I think it's a nice way to sort of divert also from the consistent sheerness that I think Nenzi's work is associated with. But then you have these little bicep length gloves that are black, they're sheer. Madison is also wearing a nice little docking moment and then you have a strappy sort of big old heel. And I think that also is a way of sort of taking Nenzi's work and letting it be more of like a background element to a dress that is different than what you normally associate with the brand. Do we think it's revolutionary? Do we think it's over the top? Do we think it's kooky crazy, you know, wonderful? No, but do we think that it fits Madison's aesthetic while also sort of channeling elements of the Nenzi Dojaka brand while also showing a different sort of side of that brand? Yes. And so that I think is good. That I think works. That I think is smart. Michael B. Jordan is next wearing Valentino. I believe this is haute couture. This is hot. It's hot. It's hot. Hot, 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 hot. I know you're gonna be like, oh, well, that's men's wear. It's so boring. They're gonna be mean to men in 2022. Not Michael B. Jordan. I think that this differentiation of colors here for other brands, I'd say, ugh, mess. But with Valentino, it's what Pierpaolo does. It's all of these different little colors that come together to create a bit of intrigue, a bit of excitement. The coat is beautiful. The coat is stunning. I think it's wonderful. That gray is deep. And then on top of that, you have the white shirt, a little sort of brown, grayish, taupey pant. It's not anything crazy to write home about. And the black shoe. The jacket really is like the big thing, the big wonderful thing. The rest of it is kind of background to the coat, but it's fine. That's it. It's fine. Next up, let's talk about Miley Cyrus. Now she is wearing Gucci here. Now this, I believe is from the spring 2022 collection. It channeled the sort of 1940s, 1930s Hollywood Walk of Fame. It was on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The show was there, yada, yada. We know, we know. It's a red little plunging dress with a big sort of sheer flowing out skirt moment. It has big sort of feather boa sleeves. And then the bottom of the dress is piped or trimmed in little feathers as well. Definitely sort of channeling this idea of boudoir fashion, you know, the starlets again of the 1930s, the 1940s. I think it works. I think it makes sense. I think when you look at Alessandro's idea for the collection, this fits in beautifully. And at the same time, Gucci is not a brand that you think of as like a gown. You know what I mean? Red carpet, it happens most definitely, but it's something that you don't think of the extravagant over the top, ridiculous sort of gowns in the way that you think of a lot of other brands like a Dior or a Chanel, a Valentino. Here, I think that is trying to channel. Here, I think we're getting this channeling of the gown element, but also this campy sort of fun, a little bit out of the box inspiration that Alessandro has sort of worked through and worked with throughout his entirety at Gucci. I think it works. I think it's fun. I think it makes sense. Miley is a Gucci girl from my understanding and it was, it was cute. 
And I'd like to see her in more of these because there were a bunch of them that were really, really good. Next up, we have Nicole Kidman. She is wearing Armani Privé. She's one of the great Armani Privé women of the world. And I think this dress, honestly, I think it works. I think we've seen styles like this before. Either it was in 2020 or 2021, we were seeing dresses like these from Armani, from the Haute Couture collections. And I think here in this gray, it's really, really lovely. Do I think maybe it's the best color matching for Nicole? No. I don't, but I do think the dress in and of itself is rather lovely. Do I think the crystal encrusted bra is best? No, but really willing to let this micro pleat gray organza dress just be stunning and not really looking at any of its flaws because it's just, it's, it's nice, it's lovely. The texture of it is beautiful. The color of it is really, really lovely. Whether or not it was placed properly on people, that's a different conversation. But without a doubt, the dress is stunning. It is gorgeous, it is beautiful, and the crystal crystal encrusted bra is maybe not what everybody would want from it, but I do think it's trying to update and play on the style that we've seen previously and make it a little bit more different, a little bit more new, sort of branch out to different customers that might not just want to cover everything up, but rather have some sort of semblance of the breast area for viewing pleasure of the people that are seeing it or themselves, more so for themselves, right? Yeah, so. Overall, I think it's a great dress. Next up is Normani. She is wearing Mugler. I believe this is fall 2021. Now, some of you are gonna say, oh, Luke, why do you like that? But I think that this is actually a very good mixing, again, of Casey Cavalader's idea of Mugler and also the heritage of the brand. It's skin tight, it's a skirt with a bra, and then pretty much just an asymmetrically cut little bodysuit that goes all the way up to the wrist area. It swags and swerves and curves and moves moves and grooves, it goes all the way down the legs. Now you're probably gonna say, look, where, where is the elements of Mugler? You know what I mean? There's not this exaggerated silhouette, there's not this crazy kooky blah blah blah. The star. Here's the thing. Mugler perfume was in the shape of a star, the bottle. I did actually get to do a press preview with Casey where we talked about the collection and that was sort of one of the looks that I said. The star. We don't really see this a lot from you. Like, is this coming from the perfume element? Like, what are we trying to do with that? And so Casey's talked about how this is essentially trying to use that pulling, that sort of warping, that sort of distortion of a Mugler sort of element, a motif, and sort of trying to bring it into his view and his perspective of the brand. And I think it works. I think it's something that needs to, you know, keep being played upon, keep sort of being pulled and moved and grooved. But I appreciate that again, it's not just relying on us crazy silhouette. Casey is trying to evidently bring these elements of the brand in and make them modern. And I think that's what designers that are at houses like a Mugler or like a Carolina Herrera and Oscar Lorenta need to do. So you need to bring that history into the modern sort of perspective for a customer to understand where it's coming from. And I think this is a good way. I think Normani also looks good. Look solid. Next up, we have Olivia Rodrigo. She's wearing Calvin Luo. Now, listen, Olivia looking like she walked out of Hot Topic. I kind of don't hate for her because I think kind of what her shtick is a little bit. It's very sort of grungy. It's very sort of Marc Jacobs, Perry Ellis S. The sheer top, I think, works. The green bow is like that hideous green, kind of like you know, Revolt Against Beauty, Mucha Prada, the Ugly Chic Collection kind of vibe. That color is, it's such a good color. And then the little black piping on the end of it, I think really is lovely. I know people are gonna be like, it looks like pasta, but like, listen, that's a pasta I would eat. You then have this high-waisted little skirt dress that obviously the sheer top is tucked into. I think it works. I think it fits in. I think it, you know, has a very Wednesday Adams vibe. And then I think the shoes are really the best part. The little almost knee-high sheer your socks with the big old pumperoonies, the Mary Jane moment. I think it works and gets understandable. I think it's good. It's fine. Again, this is like her Wednesday Adams experience and lovely. Next, let's talk about Rihanna. Now, she is wearing Bottega Veneta, and I believe that this is a custom piece, and if it's not custom, I don't think it's been shown either in lookbooks or on the runway, which for Rihanna makes a lot of sense. This look, I believe, is a take on a fall 2021 top that was done in leather, and it has a little tassel at the end. So again, this conversation of leather, texture, fringe, to a degree is like, texturizing a fabric. So it's playing on that. And again, I think it makes sense. Now she is doing a little asymmetrical neckline here, but instead of it falling into like a pant, like it does on the runway, it's a full sort of dress. Has a little bit of a bias cut feeling to it. I guess it's not actually a leather because I don't know if one would want to cut 
leather on the bias. You know what I mean? Just wouldn't be as silky and flowy and clingy in all the right places. I think it works. I think the color is nice. I do think the waist is a little bit strange. I understand that due to the bust area sort of being the bust. It doesn't exactly fit perfectly at the waist, but I think we can see a little bit of the pulling on the sides, which looks strange. And so I say if that is a custom look, then one would want that to maybe fit a little bit better. Also with bias, it's just, it's hard because it's a silk, so it's gonna crease really, really easily. So you can see sort of the lines, you can see a little bit of puckering throughout. You also then can see the seams of the bias, cutting in the stitches and all of that, which just doesn't help. You can see that on the bottom. I think from the waist up, it's a really, really nice look, but I just think Bottega maybe needs to work on their custom a little bit harder. They don't do a whole lot of red carpet dressing and all of those sorts of things. And only because of Daniel Lee has it really come into sort of the limelight recently. I'm hoping that under Matthew Blasey, they sort of push for a much more custom sort of red carpet aspect of dressing because I think having teams that are really, really dedicated to that, over time, it will become something that is much easier to understand, much easier to do. And also hoping that Rihanna sort of stays as a big Bottega wearer. They'll know her measurements like the back of their hand and it'll be easier to fit pieces like that. So I think the color is really, really great. I just think that on the bias is not exactly Bottega's strong suit yet. Next up is Sandra Oh, and she is wearing the vampire's wife. Now this is a very sort of 1940s styling going on here. You can see the pussy bow blouse moment. You have those sort of big 1940s shoulders. There's a little blouse that sort of flows into a high-waisted wide leg pant. It just, it, it screams the 1940s. But I think the silvery pink fabric does sort of work. It does give it a little bit more of a fun, exciting sort of style. And I think that Sandra O oh honestly is a titan in terms of acting. Maybe she's trying to reference, you know, the great actresses of the 1940s. Even if she's not, I think that this kind of look works. I think the pink is really, really sweet, but the fact that it's in this metallic, so it's kind of silvery with the light as well, sort of adds a little bit of dimension and fun. Sort of 1940s classic ideal of a silhouette also is really cool, really exciting. I think it's a nice look, genuinely. Next up is Sarah Jessica Parker, and she is wearing Oscar de la Renta. Now, I'm presuming that this look, which was worn to the end then, just like that premiere, is a reference to Carrie's look from the first Sex and the City or the intro or whatever. Again, like, I've seen eight episodes of Sex and the City total and like 15 minutes of, and just like that, because I was bullied into it. The referencing, it, it's, it's kind of lost on me a lot, so apologies. But I'm presuming that this Oscar de la Renta dress, which is pretty much just a little fitted sort of debutante silhouette done in a nice gray, is probably a reference to that tutu look from the first episode, or again, the intro, I'm really not sure. I probably should look it up, but like, too lazy for that. You can see, obviously, there is some sort of embroidery going on. Again, Oscar de la Renta sort of classic in terms of house codes. And then the pink that is shown, because the fact that the dress is sort of asymmetrically pulled up, almost like it's being sort of like, I don't know, lifted like a curtain. It's not normally something that I would go for. But I will say that Fernando Garcia and Laura Kim, again, who are the creative directors of Oscar, if you forgot from earlier, very much so have brought an asymmetrical sort of deconstructed element to Oscar in the past few years. They have it for their own brand, Monse, and I think that they've also sort of brought those little elements into Oscar too, which gives Oscar a bit more modernity. It's not just a brand for ladies who lunch anymore. The ladies who lunch most definitely still are buying the brand. But at least with this sort of trying to deconstruct, reconstruct, and give sort of fun, not only historical heritage elements of Sex and the City, but also playing on the different elements of Oscar of the past and Oscar of the present, at least it's trying to recreate and modernize elements of both Oscar and Sex and the City. So do we think that it's amazing? No, and maybe if I had watched more Sex and the City, I would be a little bit more enamored by it. Do I think that the referencing is really, really smart and on it, both in terms of the brand, the designers, and Sarah Jessica Parker and Carrie herself? Absolutely. Do I think that the cape is necessary? No. I just I think maybe that for me is the hard sort of area to understand is had we done it without the cape, maybe it would have hit home for a lot of people, maybe more so in the sense of this is a great reference to Sex and City, Carrie. Construction, it works, it fits well. It's just the cape sort of throws 
a lot off. Next up is Sarah Paulson. She is wearing Prada. It's this, uh, this is hard. Now, I understand that these floral motifs are obviously a reference to, I believe, the first Prada collection that was done by Raph and Yucha. I just don't think here it hits as well as we'd love. I do think that the little belt is a great reference to Prada collections of the past, namely like the early 1990s, where there were a lot of sort of military inspired styles and these sort of buckled belts were brought in and they said Prada on them and that was great then. Not as great now. And especially with the look in and of itself, it just seems like it would have been easier for Sarah to have something that maybe was a little bit more designed. I get it's a dress. That's great. I understand it. But I just think there are better Prada looks from that collection that would have made a little bit more sense. I think Sarah Paulson would have pulled off one of those off the shouldery sort of coats, which are so beautiful, and then also have a lovely historical reference to Mucha herself, and I think would have done so, so well. I think also the fact that this is probably like a cotton really doesn't help when you have those like gorgeous silks, again, that were in that collection. So yeah, maybe if we had added one of those cutout turtlenecks underneath or something, it would have just been a little bit more exciting, but this is kind of blah, and that's hard. You know what I mean? I, I, I'll take a kooky crazy over the top, Prada that I can't really understand rather than muted, sad, boring Prada that is not minimal and is not referencing the minimalism of the late 1990s is just meh. Next up is Storm Reed. She is wearing Crèche. Now this I believe is a look from not spring 2022, but maybe fall 2021. And here it's a halter style that came back in the 1970s. Courage began in the 1960s, but also was very much so in flux during the 1970s. So I think that's kind of where this halter style is coming from. You also have it as like a jumpsuit, I believe. And then the back is stunned because it really does expose so much of the back. Courage loved to cut out himself. I mean, especially for like the 60s, they were kind of like seductive, salacious cutouts. And I think Nicola de Felice really goes for it and doesn't sort of stray away from that in any sort of manner. But at the same time, you think of Courage, you think very sort of minimal, clean lines. And I think that you do get that here. I think the minimality of this really sort of very light, light, light beige has that really crisp, clean, futuristic almost sterile feel. But at the same time, the way that whatever that excess fabric is that sort of cuts out, creates curvature, it creates shape. And then it's all just one jumpsuit. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's a suit. It's not trying to be kooky. It's not trying to be crazy, even though it is kooky and it is crazy. Do I wish that maybe it fit a little bit better right around, you know, the sort of hip area? I understand it has pockets and I think that's really, really great. But you know, when you see the, the lines there, it doesn't help. But besides that, I actually think it's a pretty solid look with good, Good solid moments. Storm Reed looks nice. She looks fun. She looks chic. Storm Reed is a fashion girl. She is. Next up is Tessa Thompson. She is wearing Del Corre. Now, Del Corre is an Italian brand. It's one of the newer Italian brands that is actually making Italy more exciting in terms of being a fashion capital. And I'm not trying to be shady to the Italians, but like New York, need I say more? But oftentimes with the Italian brands, it's the Versace, the Prada, the Valentino, the Dolce and Gabbana, et cetera, et cetera, that it's all these established brands and it's very rare you have sort of like younger, newer brands that are coming up. So the fact that this, I'm gonna go with this as like synthetic, almost vinyl sort of style. It's off the shoulder, it's a peplum top. It has these crazy rigid like wing sleeves and then it has a matching sort of vinyl skirt. It's strange, it's weird, but I think it also fits in with Tessa Thompson. She's very rarely afraid to go for it at any point. And I think it actually is really, really nice. If you took off the crazy sort of bat sleeve wing experience, it would still be a nice, pretty look. It fits her really, really well, but at the same time, those sleeves really give it that extra oomph, you know what I mean? She's ready to take flight and I can't wait to watch. Next up is Tracy Ellis Ross, the boss. She is wearing Bottega. Now this is a fully sequined look. Again, we can just talk about texture. There's so much texture when it comes to Bottega. That's what makes it so, so great. It's a turtleneck red gown full of sequins. And again, expensive. That's why Bottega is so expensive. And for the most part, it's just a sort of pouchy little bag that goes along with it in a tan. I think she looks great. Tracy Ellis Ross always is going for it. I appreciate it always. Thank you. And last but not least, we're talking about Zendaya. Now, if you are not a channel member, I apologize in advance. We're gonna be going through a couple of her looks for the Spider-Man premiere. Now I know I did a whole video about Dune and her looks. Maybe it was a little bit ill. 
ill-timed and I should have just waited for the Spider-Man method dressing experience to come and happen, uh, but it's fine. We're, we're working through it. I'm not upset at all. So first up, we have this Valentino look. Now, this was a hand-embroidered slip dress with this beautiful high slit. It has these little black spider cobwebs all throughout it. There are pictures from Pier Paolo Piccioli that have all the little atelier workers hand sewing the beautiful sort of embroidery on it. It's gorgeous. It's stunning. Again, I think the fact that the color sort of matches is the skin tone is stun, it's gorgeous, it works. Cobwebs obviously play on the idea of Spider-Man who slings cobwebs. There's not much more that one could ask for, especially when it comes to actually playing to the theme of what you are in and what you are promoting. Zendaya is a top tier method dresser is the top tier method dresser, I would say, in my opinion. So that is the end of today's video. And with that, let's talk about the best and the worst looks of the month. Best, 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 best. Billie Eilish in there with the Simone Rocha. Storm Reed in the Courage. I'm gonna throw Miley Cyrus in the Gucci. Oh, Zendaya in the Valentino. As for the worst dressed, Lana Del Rey. We already knew that. That's fine. There's nobody else that can even compete with that. It was just a national uh, travesty. I have the summertime sadness and it's and it's January. Thank you guys so much for watching again. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.